So rest of it is your airframe, your engine, and so on. Right? So anyway, you want to bring down that as far as possible. You want to increase the payload fraction because that's what pays me money. So the more payload I can carry for a given weight of aircraft, it's better for me. Right? So we are always trying to reduce the weight. Right? In my remaining say, what are seventy percent of your weight? You know, uh, it's not all airframe. So when you talk about an aircraft, you have to understand there are different components. Right? There's an airframe. What do we mean by airframe? Strip it out of electronics, strip it out of engine, strip it out of payload. What are remains in your airframe? Right? And then did I miss anything? That's it, right? I mean, so, and then, uh, so if you look at engine, engine is also a significant weight. It could be uh, sort of, you know, uh, you know, 5, 10% of the engine has some weight. Electronics nowadays are not that heavy. Right, and then you have some support systems. Right, you may have servo hydraulics, and uh, if you prefer a larger aircraft, and so on. Right, those are all support systems, etc. So overall, airframe is not even going to be. Uh, of course, I forgot most important thing: fuel. Fuel, right? In addition to engine, in a propulsion system, I have engine and fuel. For a large, you know, long range aircraft, fuel weight is significant. Right. So if you put all these things together, you get your get on to your hundred percent. So where all are we going to try and reduce weight? Of course, everywhere. Okay. Engine, well, that's something which I can do to engines to make with them reduce weight. And what kind of materials do we use in engine? Right? Is a different. It, it, it's, that's an engine is a different ball game altogether as compared to air freight. So in an air freight, yes, we do use aluminum alloys. In an engine, we use aluminum alloys. Yes or no? We can look at some components of your. Let's say you are using an IC engine. Then I will be using. Let's say if I am using a turbine engine. In certain stages, certain components of this turbine engine, I may use aluminum. Certain other stages, I may not use aluminum. Why? What is the problem with aluminum? I think quite high, very low. So it may not take very high temperatures, right? So I will end up using uh, things like titanium I6L4V as a common alloy. Titanium alloy, right? So I use titanium alloy. Some places, uh, you know, even titanium has certain limit, temperature limit. Beyond that temperature limit, uh, in gas turbines, especially, I may want to achieve much higher temperatures of the order of 2000 Kelvin, right? Uh, so if you want that kind of temperature, there are internal based alloys, right? Internal based alloys are, uh, may not be uh, nickel based alloys, uh, may not be, um, uh, what should I say, they, they are not as lightweight. But then they go up to higher temperature. For that temperature range, among the materials available, nickel based alloys will be the best, right? Best, not just, uh, okay, I'll come back to the other part. Right? So, anyway, so everybody understands that for airframe, let's not worry about engine. I mean, I just gave this overview just to make you understand that if you look at a gas turbine engine, it's a very complex system. A gas turbine engine is really, really a complex system. In fact, uh, 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 Ramakrishnan, I mean, our distinguished alumnus, uh, he was a former uh, deputy director of PSSC. Um, so when he gave a, gave a talk, he was talking, I mean, somebody asked him, uh, you know, we are making, you know, launch vehicles which go all the way to the space. And, uh, but then why aren't we have able to develop our own uh, indigenously built gas turbine engines? So he said, look, if you look at launch vehicles, I have a nozzle, I have propellant, I have a nozzle, I'm pushing, burning it and pushing through nozzle. Is that? I mean, of course, it's not as simple as that. There are other things that you need, especially when you go looking at yeah, whether it's solid propellant or liquid propellant, there are other systems that you need to be have in place. But relatively, that rocket system is a lot simpler. So that we are able to track. But gas turbine, there's a lot more uh, uh, that needs to be done in gas turbine, right? And of course, tendency again, just like uh, we discussed the other day, if you look at the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, it's HL, they make airplanes, but majority of the jobs are for mechanical and electrical, right? And then you, you know, 20% of jobs are for aero because only 20% need to know the, all, the, all the aspects of it. Even others need to know it superficially, but 20% need to know full breadth of it. Whereas a whole lot of people will be designing individual components. So if they're designing an electronic component, they have to be from electronics background. Designing a mechanical component, they have to be from mechanical component, mechanical background. So same way, if you look at a gas turbine engine, Right? There are various aspects to this gas turbine engine. One aspect is how am I designing a compressor? How does how, how does the fluid flow go? So actually the fluid mechanics guys or aerodynamics guys are the ones who need, right? And then the combustion part, right? Once you compress the air, you're going to burn something. How efficiently can I burn so that I don't have I mean the combustion is as complete as possible and it's uh, and then you have to again push the those hot gases through your turbine stages and so on, right? So this is all, I mean, whole lot of it is actually CFD and fluid mechanics and aerodynamics. Little bit of it is propulsion. And 
The real challenges which all companies face in making any gas like this, and aerodynamics also to an extent, they can work it out. Propulsion, again, propulsion is again something they have kind of been working on it. They know what are the parameters that you need to vary to get a better engine, better engine means, but you know, better power to weight ratio. I want as high a power as possible for as low a weight as possible. They figured that out where that stuff is. If they don't know, for example, if you keep increasing the temperature, you get better efficiencies. Where that stuff is, where are, where are the materials which can withstand this temperature? Right? So that's that's where a whole lot of research is going on in the materials. Right? There are materials which can withstand a very high temperature, but you can't machine them. You can what is why do you machine them to take a block of this material and bring it to the shape that you want? Because design is all about bringing it to proper size and shape. So if you want to machine it, that becomes very difficult. So whole lot of challenges are in materials and manufacturing. And then there are structural dynamic problems because your blades are rotating and uh, uh, material, and again, creep and fatigue, those problems are also there. The blades might start you know, expanding during this very high loads and high temperature and start touching your casing, right? If you go, if, if the blade goes and touches the casing, your problem with this is you know, kind of scratching the casing. Uh, but you cannot put a very long gap, between large gap between the two, because then air will not pass through your uh, blades, it will bypass your blades and so on. So how do you optimize this? These are all quite a few challenges. So what I'm trying to impress upon here is even when, even though a lot of us tend to think, okay, if there's a gas turbine engine that we want to design gas turbine engine, oh, it's all in propulsion domain. No, I mean, only a small part of it is in propulsion domain, right? A whole lot of it is in air dynamics domain. Then you need to have some structural dynamics, you need to have some uh, uh, materials manufacture, right? These are all events again uh, interdisciplinary in nature, even to make just one small engine, right? And proportion is just one part of that, right? Then, um, anyway, so pro uh, that I'll leave it at that, that for engine. I'll come to come back to air frame. All of, all of you said typically we used to use aluminum. Why aluminum? Why not steel? Why not steel? Why not uh, titanium? Why not water? Why not light? Because we know why not light. Yeah. Lightweight. Lightweight. Right. So what do you mean by lightweight? There are materials which are lighter than copper is lighter. Right. So cheap. Huh? Cheap. Cheaper. Okay. Cheaper. Correct. Huh? Or corrosive resistance. Steel. For I mean, yeah, stainless also. Huh? Availability. Huh? Availability. Both go hand in hand. Yes. Huh? Ductile in nature, aluminum is not as ductile. High tensile strength. High tensile strength, right? So when you talk about all this lightweight strength, etc., you have to combine them together. So typically we don't talk in terms of only strength or only lightweight, right? And I can have materials which are lighter than this, but their strength may be very bad. Or I can have materials which are much stronger, but maybe very heavy as well. So we always talk about ratios, right? We talk about how much strength do I get for a given weight. Right? I should get a given because if it's lower strength, but the density is really, really low. Even if it's lower strength, I you know, increase the size. Right? As long as for my given application, for my given operational condition, right? As long as I can bring down the weight, that's all I care. But the operational condition demands that it carry certain load. Corresponding to that load, it will have some stress in it. So to carry that particular stress, I can always increase the to make sure that the stress never crosses this uh, uh, value, I can always increase the thickness. I can always, I mean, in a, in a, in a skin or something, I can always increase the thickness. It's okay. So material size can vary. So overall, I look at all these design uh, parameters, like what I say, okay, let me use aluminum. For aluminum, what should be the thickness? Let's say that turns out to be some one mm. Let's say instead of that, I use titanium. That thickness turns out to be 0.5 mm. Then I have to go back and see, okay, which one makes better sense because overall, I mean, 0.5 and 1 mm, I decided based on how much load it has to carry. Then I go back and calculate the weight and say, okay, which one is, it will be lighter, right? So we always talk about strength to weight ratio. Strength to weight ratio is just this strength divided by the weight, right? A good measure of that is small, or most of you would have definitely heard about. Whether it's CS or electrical background, you would have had some uh, basic knowledge about heat stress, ultimate stress, right? I take a material, I keep on loading, it will start undergoing plastic deformation, permanent deformation at some point. An estimate of that point, that is the elastic limit, estimate of that point is your heat stress, right? So if you take that heat stress or you can take ultimate stress, whatever it is, that is strength. 
of your material. Beyond that, material just fails, breaks into two pieces, right? By the way, that's not the only way structures fail, right? Maybe I should take a step back and talk about how do structures fail. One is material failure. Material failure, I mean your stress process or uh, I will not go much beyond that. Stress is most closely or yield strength or ultimate strength, whatever it is, depending upon your application. Most applications we use yield strength because we don't want permanent deformation because we want to reuse. There are certain applications. I may not want to reuse, then I have to think whether I need to use yield strength or ultimate strength. So, material failure, stress goes to your yield strength, and then it just has permanent deformation, I can't use it anymore. Right? That is material failure, or it may even break into two pieces. That is your material failure. But that's not the only form of failure. When you talk about failure, that's not the only form of failure. Another other forms of failure is excessive deformation. Right? Then it may be too flexible. The material may be too flexible. Right? If it's too flexible, I design this material as uh, under its load. Yes, it's not heating, it's not failing, but it's deforming too much and it's going and hitting an adjacent component. Or let us say we are talking about uh, your wing. Right? Your wing has been nicely designed. Right? And then uh, for a given angle of attack, you assume this is going to be my angle of attack all along the all along the span. Of course. Wings are also given some twist, right? You know, in the, at, at under zero load condition, some of the wings will also have some twist because it will it can also have twisting moment depending upon the loading, etc. It will, can also have twisting moment because of which you know if I have twisting moment in the sense of can I use it? So if I look at this, if let's say this is the place where the wing is connected to my airplane, this is the free surface. If there is twisting moment acting on it, this will lift up. So my angle of attack will increase. Right? Or if it's on the way, angle of attack will decrease, right? Whatever, you can think of which way it will happen. But anyway, so angle of attack can change. So, and if it's too flexible, that change can be too high. You can't handle that. So, excessive deformation can also be a problem, right? Or flexibility. Flexibility can also be a problem. Some amount of rigidity is required, right? Another other, another problem is you have all, all uh, heard of aeroelasticity. Something called aeroelasticity. Aeroelasticity basically is interaction between aerodynamic forces and structural uh, forces, if I may put it that way. Right? So, one of the classic cases you can go and look up uh, in internet, there is something called a Tacoma bridge mm -hmm. collapse. Tacoma bridge collapse, where you know what happened with the bridge was a bit, was not, not, was not as rigid, it's quite rigid. But then what happened is when there was wind blowing, right, the energy from this wind blowing was being transferred to your bridge effectively. So, the energy from your aerodynamic forces was being transferred to your structure. So, what happened is it started gradually oscillating with larger and larger amplitude, and it, that's called your flutter. In some sense, it's like your flutter, and then it eventually broke into two pieces. Huge bridge, right? right? So, that's what happened, right? That is your aero, classic aerolysis problem. Other thing, flutter, other examples we can also give is I take a paper and then I blow on it, it will just do it, start flutter, right? It will just start vibrating. So that's also like that. that can also be a problem. Right? There is excessive deformation or if you know lack of rigidity, lack of stiffness. Material has to be stiff enough, right? Or another form of failure is that anybody else have any mechanical background is at least know the thing. Huh? Fitting failure. I will put it under material. I know this or sigma is the uh, uh, you know uh, fitting, let me put fitting failure. Pretty free. They are also material failure because when it, when it goes to certain number of cycles, even if you apply load below, what is fatigue? Fatigue is again. I give this standard example of uh, I know how many. I don't know how many of you go through. Yeah? Any of you go Good, good game. Yeah. No. <laughs> so uh, I just told other guys, uh, good guys. So I have to now bump you off. But anyway, so Jim, any of you do weights? Uh, so let us say you have to do one kg weight. How many times can you perform? Three times. Five hundred times. Fifty times. Okay. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't go and do this. I don't know. <laughs> so fifty times. 
if you uh, if I give you two cages, huh? Huh? Third test, or what? Right? And then similarly, but then if I go the other direction, 500 grams, you can probably go hundreds of times, right? So that's how it works. So the larger the weight, you know, you know, then why do why do why can't you do it more than 50 times? After 50 times, what happens? The bloody muscles start aching, right? That is your pity. That is that is the that, that fatigue we have been defining with respect to biological systems for a very long time. Or I can you know uh, if it is a steeper gradient, I can only walk this long a distance. If the if it is a flat region, I can walk much larger distance and so on. This is all and beyond that I get fatigue, muscle fatigue with my fur or my overall body might fatigue or whatever it is. Right? This is what we have been always been calling fatigue in our biological systems, our own body. Right? Same concept we have adopted here. So what happens is if you apply all the way to sigma yield, it will fail immediately. Right? But if I go only to 90% of sigma heat, still it fails if I keep on loading and unloading. That's what he's doing effectively when he's going to the public diet, right? So, same thing happens here. Let's say I go to 90% of heat stress, keep on loading and unloading. Most of my cases involve this loading and unloading cycle, right? So, you keep on loading and unloading. After 1000 cycles, it fails. I can go all the way to 60%. I can keep on loading and unloading. It's only 60% of heat stress. If I keep on rolling and unloading, it will fail after one lakh cycle. So it will fail after a certain number of cycles. Right? So I have to design taking that into account. But still, finally, material fails. So I'll include it under material failure. Creep means at high temperature, you apply load and gradually it starts and permanently. Creepy starts. But again, excessive deformation is second part. What other form of failure do you think? Do you know? Mechanical gates. Help me out. Have you? There are so many related stiffness, but have you heard of buckling? What is buckling? Okay, does this fit in material failure? Material failure means material should give up. It should yield, it should fail, it should break, whatever. Huh? Uh, they bend, they bend too much. Right? So it's not exactly it's still stiffness related. Right, it's not just for just uh, looking at you know I am having excessive deformation as well. See, this is something that we call as stability, right? Stability, stability as well. Right? Why do we call it stability? Stability. You all of you learned stability in your high school, but I learned well, other people too. Right? All of you learned stability. What was the example given for? Stability, unstable system, stable system, neutrally stable system. Huh? Bowl, yeah. So I take one cup, I put a um, uh, ball in the center, I push it slightly away from the center, it will stay there. Right? That's its equilibrium position. I push it slightly away, it will come back. Correct? If I take this cup, push the ball slightly away, it will come back. Right? It will try to come back to its original equilibrium position. So it's a stable system. Right. So similarly, if I put the cup upside down, right, I can still somehow manage to balance my ball right on the top. I again perturb it a little bit, it will go off, it will run off, it will go to as far away from my equilibrium, uh, equilibrium condition as possible, stable equilibrium position as possible. That is an unstable system. Neutral is flat, flat surface. I take this ball, I just push, wherever I push, it will go there. That's your neutral equilibrium. Right? So, fundamentally, in, in, in all this stability, what matters is if it is, you know, if there, I think there is no perturbation, then it will just stay as it is. Right? It will just stay as it is. But if I apply small perturbation, will it come back to its and release that perturbation? I apply and release that perturbation. That's what I do when I take the ball here and then I release it. When I release it, will it come back? That is what stability is all about. Right? That's what determines. You know, you're. Uh, uh, your stability or buckling is same way, right? If I take a very thin slender thing, right, and I apply some load, right? Let's say that load reaches. I mean, some of you may not under may or may not know. There's something called a critical load at which the column will buckle, right? This is called a column because I'm applying some pressure load. At some point, it just buckle. You can take a blade. Nowadays, they don't use shaving blades, but you can take a blade or anything which is very thin and you can try to compress it. At some point, it will just go like this. There's a thin sheet of metal, it will just go buckle right place. Right? So it will buckle. So that buckling load we estimate 
as you mean, it's simple. Let us say both sides are simply supported. Maybe I should have drawn this. Let us say both sides are simply supported. Simply supported means I'm not rigidly fixing. It can just rotate at that location. So when I fix it, we have figured out some peak critical. I'm not going to write those formula at all. There's some peak critical. And that critical load is perfect, right? So now my let me step back a little bit and say, if this is a perfect, I mean, I have not drawn a perfect column, but let's say it's a perfectly straight column, no flaws in it, it's in vacuum, right? And I start applying load. Will it still buckle at that peak critical? It doesn't buckle at all, right? You can keep easily the load till it is over slender, over thin that slender it is. It will not buckle to you, it will not buckle at all, it will just go easy, right? Buckling happens because of perturbation. That perturbation could be in form of your, your uh, column may not be perfectly straight, or in this room there are there are air currents, even a small perturbation will go and it will bend a little bit due to that perturbation. Right? After it bends a little bit, it cannot come back beyond the peak critical. So unless there is a perturbation, buckling will not occur. Right? So that's why it's called a stability problem. If I take a perfect column, keep on compressing, it will only fail by heat. Right? It will fail by buckling only if I apply some perturbation. I push it a little bit and then I release it, then it will not come back. That is your perturbation all about. Of course, in regular atmosphere, there are always some air currents, even a small perturbation is good enough. For it to buckle. That's why it always buckles at P is equal to P critical. Anyway, that's one form of failure. Uh, this buckling is also related to stiffness, right? If the material is stiffer, then buckling will not occur. Only thing is, here I'm talking mostly in terms of stiffness. Here I'll talk about size and shape as well. Why do I talk about size and shape as well? Uh, paper, has anybody has a piece of paper? Just a piece of paper. So, yeah, that is something that he was also talking about the shape and all, right? So that the reason why that occurs is because if I look at this, it is buckling under its own weight. Under its own weight, it cannot even sustain. Material is not failing. It's just buckling under its own weight. But the same thing, even here, it's buckling under its own weight, right? More or less. Like, barely managing. But then moment I roll it up like this, right? And make it as a cylinder, now I can effectively balance. This is too heavy. Maybe my... This also heavy, maybe that's it. for this. No, it's okay. I can balance my entire cell phone, right? So that is what I can do just by rolling it. Because if I didn't roll it, it can barely manage its own weight. Now I can balance some weight on top of it. So buckling again, it depends on both size and shape. Even stiffness it depends on that because again he was talking to you about whether it should be like this or it should be folded like this and so on. Will increase stiffness, right? So shape also matters in both cases, right? So these are all the modes of failure. I am concentrating on this. Material failure is strength dependent, right? So when we are talking about material failure, we want material which has as high as strength to weight ratio as possible. When we talk about these things, I want as high as stiffness to weight ratio as possible. A non-dimensional, as in with geometry independent measure of the strength is what we call as stress. Right? Yield stress, like so. sigma yield. Right? That's why we came up with this definition of all these stresses and strain. Because we wanted to make things geometry independent. Right? If I want to design a, you know, length of your table, right? How would I go for doing this? Maybe not going to do that, but if I want to design. So what will I do? I look at what are the stresses it's experiencing, or what are the loads it's experiencing. But generally what there is, loads are it's experiencing. How much load can this particular rod take? But then if I take double the size of rod, it will take double the load, correct? So that's not a good measure of failure, right? I can say, oh, this rod will fail at this load. But then if I take same material that double the size, you know, it will take double the load. So uh, load, load at which it fails is not a good measure of, of a material property. It's a measure of the property of material as well as size of the size of the material that you have chosen. So to make it independent of size or geometry, we came up with this concept of stress. So we non-dimensional, not non-dimensional, we, we made it geometry independent, right? So the moment I make it stress by area, now whether I take small rod or large, I mean, smaller area of cross-section rod, larger area of cross-section rod, it will always fail at same load by load per unit area, right? That's why we call it as the stress. That's why we even define stress, otherwise we didn't want, we are not generally randomly generating extra definitions. So yield stress is a good estimate. Weight, what is a good parameter which, which can tell you, uh, uh, you know, which can tell you whether it's going to be heavy or lighter and it is geometry dependent. I want to have you use parameters which are geometry dependent. Because now I'm talking about which material to choose. Which is a good parameter? Huh? 
mass is geometry dependent. If I take, you know, one centimeter by one centimeter, one by one centimeter cube, it will be something. If I take three centimeter by three centimeter by three density, always, right? Density. So typically we measure the strength to weight by density. Similarly, strength stiffness to weight. Stiffness, what's a good measure of stiffness for material? Yeah, if material, you know, once you apply load, it will stretch, right? And then we call that stretch again stretching. You want to make it geometry independent because if I take double the length, the stretching will also double, right? For the same area of cross section. So to make it geometry independent, we define this parameter called strain, which is change in length by original length, right? And we say the stress to, I mean, so just similar to a spring. In a spring, when you apply load, right? What is the stiffness of spring? Okay. It is when I apply load, it will deform. The deformation ratio of force to deformation is your stiffness. Here, the not the geometry independent form of force is your stress. Geometry independent form if your displacement is strain. So, ratio of stress to strain is a measure of stiffness of the material. Just like ratio of force to displacement is a measure of stiffness of the strain. That ratio is what we call as Young's modulus. So, typically, we talk about this Young's modulus by density, right? These are the two parameters that are important in choosing your material, right? You all of you have said alumina is chosen because it is, some of you said as well also, sigma A and by rho is much better for alumina. Let's just quickly check. This is a, a, a titanium 6% alumina, 4% alumina, I have an idea about it, or let's say it's steel, right? Aluminum again. Uh, so what? Okay. What is when I'm talking about strength? Other question. Other point probably I should test, which is what is your what is this sigma here? Let's use consistent units, right? Sigma yield in terms of what we call as mega pascals, right? And then density is in kg per meter cube and so on. So aluminum. What is the yield strength of aluminum? Whoever gives whatever answer is wrong. Why? So that's whether it's pure aluminum or aluminum oil. Right? If it's aluminum, that's other things that you guys all need to understand. Alloys, right? Alloys matter. Right? Alloying means if I take this aluminum, put some trace elements, alloying matters, and alloying. Again, I am not going to material details. One thing you all need to remember, whether your materials gaze, mechanical gaze or water, alloying changes only the strength, not the stiffness. It changes yield strength, but it won't affect your uh, stiffness as much. Young's modulus, it doesn't affect. So if I ask what is the Young's modulus of aluminum, all of you can say 70 gigapascal. Fair enough. But if I ask what is the strength of aluminum, you should ask me back, your aluminum or aluminum alloy, if it's aluminum alloy, which aluminum alloy? So these are all automatically questions that you should ask. So somebody comes and you may be electronics gay, you may be mechanical gay, somebody who comes and says, Oh, I'm using this aluminum, you know, will it work? You should say, which alloy are you using? Only then I can do the design or uh, will it work? Or you should ask him. You should say, hey, I want to hang this. He'll say, okay, okay, I'll use aluminum. You should say which alloy. Then you'll know that okay, you know something about it, and then he'll pay attention to the details. Otherwise, he won't pay attention to the details. Anyway, so aluminum, which alloy? Let's say aluminum 2024, which is most commonly used. I will not go into details about what is 2024 part now. Right, so there's something called aluminum 2024. Typically, your uh, 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 yield stress is of the order of around. Uh, I'll make it simple so that division is easy. Um, what is aluminum density, by the way? Anybody has any idea? Density of aluminum. No, no. Is it, first of all, we all know it is heavier than water because it's seen, right? Roughly, it is about 2.7 times that of water. That is 2700 kg per meter cube. Right? 2700. Water is 1000, right? 1000 kg per meter cube. Right? So then the yield stress here is something like, let's say, 270 megapascals. Why did I choose 270? It's typically between 270 and 300. Easier to divide. So at that time, choosing like this. Then what about titanium? Titanium, this are titanium alloys. Nowadays, we do use this titanium alloys quite a bit. If I look at that number, yield stress is of the order of something of the order of around 900, right? Density is 45, right? Steel, again, what is the strength of steel? Wrong. Huh? 
right? If that becomes very expensive or not doable, then you have a problem. That's why aluminum wins out. So that is the material that I chose. Now, okay, now that I chose that aluminum material, now I have to go back and design all this aircraft components, right? So design aircraft components. Okay, let's talk which aircraft are we talking? Let's start with rotor craft. Quad rotor. All of you are going to be designing quad rotor. Quad rotor is what you know, you have four arms, and in each of those four arms, you are putting engine. Right? Each of these arms. Let's say this is one of those arms. I have the center of the quad rotor and I have arm here, arm here, and then arm here and back. Right? So each of this I am putting some engine, it is going to generate thrust, it's going to lift from here. If it's going to lift from here, there is going to be something called bedding moment. It has to withstand, right? This is effectively like a cantilever beam. Right? Cantilever beam. What kind of cross section would you choose for such a what kind of shape and size would you choose? Right? You go back. You now you first you have to ask, you know, how much weight are you carrying? Right? Overall, let us say your um, uh, quad rotor that you have designed, what weight do you want to do? 10 kgs? Let's say 10 kgs. Overall weight is 10 kg. Your quad rotor has to uh, will be generating at, at nice. How much is the will you will allow the quad rotor to be generating? 10 kgs? 10 kg force is it enough? Not enough. We discussed it yesterday. Right? Because it has to climb also, it has to go forward. So if you want a 10 kg journey, uh, and of course uh, there are other issues. In a quad rotor, one of the biggest problems in a quad rotor is just right? If it is, you know, smaller quad rotor, especially quad rotor is like now, but there is a huge wind. There is a huge wind in the drum. It will not go where you want it to go. Right? If you have additional thrust, you can manage it a little bit better. Right? So let us say 10 kg force, but overall engines and the engines you have chosen such that overall you generate at least 16 kg force. Right? So that you have this excess power. Right? So 16 kg force basically means each one is generating 4 kg force. Right? That is 40 newton. From that 40 newton, you look at the distance and then you multiply the two, you get your moment. Moment, right? So and then you choose a beam which will which you choose a structure which is like a beam which will carry that kind of thing. What is the ideal section, cross section for okay, that is the size part of the right? size I need to first determine shape part. For a given shape, I can go back and determine what should be thickness of this uh, material or what. Should it be just a rectangular block, right rectangular block? Why can't I just use a right rectangular block? Making sense? I want to carry this. I'll put on rectangular block. Right? One rectangular cross section thing. Like this is a thin cylinder rectangular cross section thing. And I'll fix my ready uh, engine to it. Done. Easy. Why would I do that? Why not? Why would you do that section? Why is it does it have more material section? Uh, because of huh? mass distribution. Mass distribution. So what happens is when you do all this analysis, I will not again go into all this analysis. Uh, I will just erase this off. So if when I do all this analysis uh, for a beam bending, finally what it ends up uh, giving you is something for um, so it's, this is my beam, right? This, this is my cross section. Beam is bending like this. About this axis, if I take any particular cross section, this is my cross section of the beam. About this axis, there is something called second area moment of inertia. Something that you would have learned in your engineering mechanics, right? So the second area moment of inertia. So about this axis, right? Let's say this is the axis. About this z-axis, you oh, sorry, uh, one more thing. This moment of inertia, which let's say this is my y, this is my beam, and beam is bending this way, right? The beam is bending this way, beam is extending, this is the cross section, and it's bending down. Right? So what actually what this represents is we you know with beam bending, if some of you remember, uh, beam bending, we make this assumption plane cross sections in main plane, right? So these are all plane cross sections which are originally planes are all parallel. Then they rotate related to each other. As the beam bends down, the plane rotates. Isn't it? If I take this, as this bends down, the cross section will rotate. The axis about which it rotates is this. So you are taking inertia about that particular axis. Axis about which cross section. So that will be equal to integral of y square dA. Right? Y square dA. Where y is distance from the axis of rotation of any area of cross section. So what is the consequence of this? If I look at this, Area, let me take some choose some small area here and same amount of area on top. Which one will contribute more to your eyes? Upper one because my y is much larger. 
and it goes as y square. So what I want to do is I want to remove as much material from the center as possible and put it on top. But when I want to put it on top, he'll come in between and say, hey, your wing, if, especially if you're taking wing, or okay, in this case, we're talking quad rotor still. In quad rotor, I don't want to make it, you know, as ideally what I want is all the mass as far away from the center as possible. Then it looks huge, right? One part. So let us say I'm even willing to do that, right? And but somehow I have got a long time view, we say I don't want to be thicker than this for whatever reason, is the thick purpose maybe, maybe some other reason. So this is as thick as it should be. So what I would do is I'd remove all the material from as much material from the center as possible. This material. I will add them all on top here. What did I achieve by this? For the same mass, same area of cross section, I took material from center, I put it on top. That is a logical thing to do, right? Because I am now moving material as far away from the center as possible. That gives me high moment of material. That's why we go for I section, right? That's why we go for I section. Why can't I theoretically keep on moving this and more and more, make this thinner, make every, everything as far away from each other as possible? If I make it very, very thin, very large plate, very thin large plate over a much wider area, bottom also very thin large plate and together connected by a very thin plate in the center. What are the issues that I will tell Thin plate will again buckle. If it's very thin, it will become too flimsy. Again, just to go back, go back. If you have just one of this, it's so flimsy. Whereas if it's a little bit thicker, it's not as flimsy. Correct that part. Right? So I make it too thin, it will too be too flimsy and I can't even, it will just buckle, it won't even take your load. Right? So that is the limit in some sense. So use I section. But is, is I section always desirable? <laughs> in your quad rotor, will I, will, do you think most of them use I section? Have you seen this quad rotor? Does anybody use I section? Why not? Why don't we do We all just argue about that I section is the best. That's why similar civil application for all these beams, you will use I section. Right? They are all three, four beams. And then there is some I section things are in some cases you just use rods and top and bottom. Right? I section beams, I think nowadays they are not using. Earlier they used to use So um, yeah, why aren't they using I section? There are other operational things that you want to do. From engine, you want to carry some, let's say it's all electric motor base. So you want to carry wiring. <laughs> right? You want to carry. Wiring to your controller, which will typically be housed at the center. Right? These are all things that you need to worry. It's not just about hey structure, this is the best I section, I'll use I section. Doesn't work. So you can go back and you can have to carry this. So that's what we can. But there's also a structural reason why I would not want to do. So effectively, what should happen is if I have this I section here at the center, It is lost more flimsy, lot more flimsy because this is very thin and this is free at this edge. Anything which is a bit free uh, deforms easily, is less stiff. If I provide a support, it will become lot stiffer, one aspect. Second thing is torsion. If it's very thin wall high section like this, when I apply torsion like uh, to that, it will easily twist. Rather than this, if I do instead of this, open section, this called an open section. Open section means there is no enclosed area. So rather than this, I will use something else. What have I done here? I have taken the central plate, split it into two and put them apart. So now what happens is if you look at this part, it's supported at both ends. Here it was supported at only one end. So this will be much stiffer. This will be much stiffer. This we did only from strength perspective. Here I have to think of stiffer also. It will be much stiffer both in bending and in torsion. Because in torsion, you can show that this will be practically useless, but this one will give you very high resistance in torsion. So you always use this closed section, right? You always use this closed section, right? So in aircraft structures, mostly what there are two things that we do. One is we want to use thin wall sections. Why thin wall sections? I want to remove material as much as possible, put as far away from possible. So I want to make it as thin as possible because other that entire thin plate I'll move as away as they are permit us to do from the central axis. So it will all be thin walled. 
right? Second aspect of it is it will also be closed. Even when we use shaft for torsion, right? Even in that shaft, you have to look, you have something called R square DA, right? If this is my, if I have a, this is a shaft, right? If I try to twist it, you know, area of cross section is, you know, as a radius R. So I have something called D is equal to R square DA. Again, it's advantageous to move material as far away from the central axis as possible. So rather, sir, in, or rather, as if I put it the other way, material very close to the center is not giving too much of moment of inertia. So what we do is we use hollow sections, right? So we always use hollow, thin walled, hollow sections, thin walled because I want to move all the material as far away as possible. I we always use in air traps such as thin walled, hollow. Close sections as far as possible, right? Close sections because they provide much higher thickness, right? They don't have loose ends. They also open sections without going to mass. Open sections cannot handle open thin wall sections cannot handle the torsion. Close thin wall sections can also handle torsion because you never know there may be some torsion also being applied on your beam. There will always be some torsion being applied on your beam, especially if some of these engines you may also want to rotate to. Provide some amount of forward motion. Wherein you know, rather than rotating the entire quad rotor, you want to you may want to rotate only the engines a little bit to get forward motion. Right. So this is one important thing. Inward, hollow, close section. Right. The motivation I just told. Right. I want to make it inward because I want to move things away, and then I want to keep things hollow. Right. And then close because open section is not good. It's not stiff. Not sub well supported enough. The component. So that is where CF also matters, right? Of course, if you do like this, and if there's compressive load on it, then it will be a problem. It will buckle easily. This won't buckle as easily, right? And so on. So it's not just about buckling again. It's not just about whether column is buckling. Each of these individual plates might buckle. Right? So that's the reason why we end up using this kind of system. Of course, right? This is for your quad rotor. That's these are the four main things that you're going to worry about, right? Mostly they are all beams and then a little bit of gas and so on, right? And then you have some four legs on which it's going to land. These four legs, when they are landing, right, they are going to be under compressive load, right? So, are you going to make this legs exactly vertical? If you make them exactly vertical, it has certain issues, coupling kind of issues. You may mean you want to make it at an angle. To make it at an angle, you will have bending moment related issue, right? If you make it nicely vertical, right, then as it lands, it will only have compressive load, axial load. Axial load stresses is only sigma is equal to P by A. Whereas if it's bending load, it's M by by A, it will be much higher. Bending loads are always much higher. That's why when you want to break something, you are not going to just apply axial load, you are always trying to bend it and break it. Right? Bending loads are uh, always lead to higher stresses. But anyway, instead of this, if you make your leg of your quad rotor like this, then load is being applied here. So at this location, you have bending moment as well. Right? So that becomes a bit of a problem. Right. So let's say I take also I take two legs like this, one leg here, one leg like this. Right. And this is my this is where my quad rotor is sitting. Right. I have two legs here. Right. One way of stiffening that direction could also be just putting a wire connecting the two. What happens when you put a wire connecting the two or a small thin rope connecting the two? These two things now cannot, if they want to bend, they want to bend like outwards like this. This will prevent it, it will fold it down. Right? Ropes or wires are things that they cannot take compressive load. If I put compressive load, thread, thread, rope, water, I put compressive load, it just collapses. Whereas they apply tensile load. So, say buckling, yeah, that is also buckling. That's like, you know, ropes buckle. Right? Similarly, this sheet, if I try to apply compressive load, it just buckles. I can apply a lot of tensile load. It will not break. So, buckling, another aspect of buckling is it will only stability and instability occurs only under compression, not under tension. So anyway, so you can just put a wire in between. So these are all the things that you should know, right? How do I go about decreasing stiffness, right? If it's only having tensile load, I can guess if it's using a rope or a thread or a wire, whatever it is. Whereas if it's undergoing compression, I need to think a little bit more carefully. Of course, in a cycle, though there is compression, they design the structure such that, you know, if folks are all designed, the way they are connected is such that it will be taking mostly tensile load, right? And so on. I used to give that example in our design all the time. Right. So uh, this is the kind of things that we need to worry about. Size, shape, what components will I choose? 
Will I choose the rectangular components? Uh, you know, or sometimes uh, can I just get away with putting a wire in between and so on? These are all the things that you need to worry about. In fact, even for fixed wing, in landing gear, we were using this kind of you know, landing gear like this. Right? Sometimes you want flexibility in landing gear. If it's too rigid, then all the um, kind of impact will be transmitted to your main body. If it's a bit flexible, the impact will not be transmitted, but it cannot be too flexible either. Right, so that, that's when sometimes when it was too, we designed something and it was too flexible, right? You know, you are having me here, and it was too flexible. The easiest thing that we did was put a wire in between, right? Just a thin wire in between. That would take thin wires can take very large loads, and we when we put the thin wire, we make the stiffness a little bit higher, right? So these are the kind of tricks that you also need. To do. But you know, this is regarding your quad rotor. The moment you now come to fixed wing. Oh, I forgot stiffness to similarly you can go back and look at stiffness to density ratio. If you look at aluminum stiffness is Young's modulus is something of the order of 70 and density is 2700, let's say 2800. So 27, 2800 water. 70 divided by 2800 is roughly huh? 70 by 2800. Point not two five. Point not two five. Ah. Point not two five, right? Yeah. So it's about 0 0.025 for titanium. The same stiffness uh, is uh, 115, roughly one and a half times this. And if you look at density, density wise, it is how much more? 900 threes are 900. Five so 5 by 3, right? 5 by 3. Density wise, it's 5 by 3 times, right? Whereas your uh, 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 stiffness is 1.5 times roughly. So 1.5 times 5 by 3, that is the kind of ratio that you will have on top of this and so on. So stiffness wise, they're all kind of similar. So if you look at this 2700, 7800, roughly three times. This is also roughly three to four times. So the stiffness to density ratio, they're all not too far from each other. So now let's go for your fixed ring aircrafts. Fixed wing aircraft, what did they want to do? He wants a wing, right? And that's why he kept on blaming me, saying that they, every time they want a very thin wing. Always aerodynamics guys want a very, very thin wing. The reason why they want a thin wing is their drag will reduce, right? And various, I mean, aerodynamically it's much better, right? But in structures, I don't want a thin wing. Why do I not want a thin wing? Right? Within that wing, I mean, the, what, what, are the, what are the kind of loads wings is? Again, let us say this is my wing. There's a distributed lift going upwards. There's also weight of wing going downwards, right? Which one is higher? Weight is higher or lift is higher? Why? That lift has to lift the entire body, right? Weight of wing is just weight of wing. Am I making sense? So typically, if you if I may give thumb rules in UAVs, right? I'm all about thumb rules, right? So if you look at your UAV, I'll give a lot of thumb rules for UAVs. Is the fixed wing UAVs because that's what I work on. So if you look at this fixed wing UAVs, some rules for various some rules starting from let's say your engine. Typically, let us say you have a smaller you know, if your overall weight, if your overall weight is some, let's say 25 kgs, typically or 25 kg, 50 kg, whatever, the engine should generate in horsepower wise, engine the horsepower uh, should be about one fifth of that number. Right? So you are designing an 80 kg fixed wing aircraft. Engine horsepower should be 80 divided by 5. Right? That's a good thumb rule. 80 divided by 5 will be 16 horsepower. Right? And so on. And that is for lower systems. Higher end systems, again, uh, about uh, if you go beyond one ton, if you go beyond one, so this keeps, I mean, the, uh, that ratio keeps increasing. As in, I can get away with you know, less and less uh, powered engines as compared to its weight as we go for larger and larger systems. Again, economies of scale work out. Beyond 1000 kgs, all you need is. You know, if you take the overall weight, divided by 10, that is horsepower you need. And that works. You can look at all the aircrafts. You take more or less all the aircrafts, all the way up to uh, uh, things like, you know, 25 uh, tons and so on. So if you look at all these airplanes, even manned airplanes, the engine horsepower requirement is going to be about one-tenth. Engine horsepower should be one-tenth of the weight in kgs. Right? So that's how it works. So that is regarding this. And similarly, when I have to talk about a UAV, so, what is it called? Uh, payload fraction, we already talked about it. It's about 15%. Structural weight fraction. What do we mean by structural weight fraction? 
Yeah. What do we mean by structural weight fraction? Structural weight fraction is the airframe alone. What fraction of it is for as compared to overall weight? In a typical uh, aircraft schedule travel, what do you think that fraction is? Structural weight fraction. 30%, that is what it is in typical aircrafts, right? But if you come back to uh, uh, UAVs, smaller UAVs, that can be as high as 50 to 60%. Let's give it as 50%. So 50% of your entire weight is airframe. Remove the engine power source and whatever your engine and your battery or water is just and then you remove your uh, electronic success. The remaining part of it is 50 to 60 percent. Let's keep it as 50 percent. Half of the weight is in a fixed wing aircraft also. Half of the weight is your airframe. Now that airframe, half of it, nearly half of it is your wing. So overall your wing is 25 percent of your overall weight, right? So weight is only 25 percent, but then the lift it has to generate will be four times that. So it's always lift which down, right? Or you cannot really neglect the self weight also because sometimes we do uh, design it unsymmetrically and so on. Anyway, we'll come back to this. So now I have this wing. It has to bend upwards, right? Right. It has to bend upwards. So when it has to bend upwards, this bending moment, so I need to have something which inside it which will take this bending loads, right? And then I have to maintain that aerodynamic shape. If I don't maintain that aerodynamic shape, I won't get the lift that I want, right? And it should not bend, right? So to take care of bending, so what we do is, uh, so this is my, oh, this diagram I had in my presentation, but now I don't want to load the presentation. So this is your airfoil, this is your wing. So what we do is we have something called a spar, which runs all along the length. So this spar is typically I section. Right, and then similarly, I could have one more spar located here. Right, right. This is the typical section. Why do we go for this? Again, I want this wing to be hollow. Why do I want wing to be hollow? We already discussed various reasons for that. There are a few other reasons. I am not going to get into this now. Right, and then we want this to be hollow. But then, if we want it to be hollow, I need some stiffness. Otherwise, the skin will buckle. Right, or I can do. Skin itself, I can increase the thickness. Am I making sense? Forget about why do I need all this spar war and all everything. If you look at big wing, people will talk about spar. Forget about it. I'll just use just a very thick skin. I mean, if I make it thicker, skin thicker, then it will withstand all the buckling loads, right? So I will make the skin thicker. If I make the skin thicker, it will become very heavy, right? So I keep reducing the skin and stiff, you know, to prevent buckling, I keep providing some additional supports in between. That is your stiffness in between. So that's what I am trying to do here. Am I making sense? I want to keep it as thin as possible, but I provide additional support such that it doesn't work. That will give the, be the most optimum way. So you have to go through an optimization routine, saying that, hey, is it good enough to do only thick skin, very thick skin, or should I do something like this, right? In some of the smaller UAVs, you know, there is a limitation on how thick, how thin your skin can be, right? So let's say you are making it part of composite. Each composite layer is going to be 0.25 mm minimum, right? You want at least two composite layers. Already is 0.5 mm. You cannot go below 0.5 mm. That thickness alone might be adequate. You may not even need a additional thickness to that. That is thickness because your weights are all very low, loads are all very low. If for those low loads, it may never buckle, right? Because this minimum thickness is already there. You can't go below that thickness, right? Whereas in certain larger UAVs, the minimum thickness that you can achieve may not be adequate. You may want to retain that minimum thickness and provide only stiffness in between. Right? Again, a classic case of how stiffness works so well, you know, is a kite. All of you have you have flown kite. In a kite, you can make the entire kite to be from a very thick sheet. So when you do, you take a very, very flimsy paper. It's really, really flimsy. We used to make it even out of newspaper, right? So you take this newspaper or color paper or water, very, very flimsy paper. And you put two sticks. One stick goes like this, other stick goes. Like so that's it. With that stiffness, I mean, then it's really, really lightweight. Then it will ensure that the paper doesn't fold. Folding is nothing but buckling. The same thing we are doing here. You make it as thin as possible, and you provide stiffness in between. That is this part. Of course, I have made an all sorts of argument here, and I said you really want to have a closed section. Here, if you look at almost all spars, it will be open section, right? I section. Is there a contradiction? 
Right, I put all these pandas, A, hey, use close section, close section. Here I am putting a nice section, is there a contradiction? Engineering, I don't like contradiction. Real life contradiction will be better. No. Less thrust. No. Fixed spring. What am I wing? Is having all kinds of loads. In fixed spring, I will put typically my engine in my fuse latch, right? And it is moving, and then wing is having just generating lift, and it's bending. It will have some torsion and so on. Because it has torsion, I would want post section. But here my spar is only I section. Is there a contradiction? Don't look at the individual component. Look at structure as a whole. Structure as a whole is a closed section. Right? This is I section. But this is my structure. There is a skin all over the place. Right? So if you look at this part, isn't it closed? This part also isn't it closed? So it is closed section. My spar alone is I section. That's all. But if I look at overall section, it's a bunch of closed section cells put together. So there is this cell, there is one cell here, one cell here. This may or may not remain a cell because typically at this I section is where we also provide uh, uh, connections for your flaps, ailerons and so on. Right? That's where this helps. This additional thing helps. In addition, instead of providing good stiffness, it will also provide you a location where you can connect your flaps, ailerons. But anyway, so it is overall structure is closed. I will always ensure overall structure is closed. Right? That is the best option for me always. It, I avoid open sections, right? This is closed section, but this far alone will be I section. So in addition to that, if I want to make it keep it thinner and thinner, this width may still be large enough that it may end up buckling. We can show that for buckling again, if the width is larger, it will buckle faster. If the width is smaller, it will buckle much later because you know load is taking larger width. If it's uniformly distributed load, large width, the width is also taking larger load. Smaller width is taking smaller load, and within that slip, it's not going to buckle. Right, so here you will end up putting some additional things, additional stiffness. These are all called, this is called spar. This additional stiffness are all called stringers. Effectively, what those, what these stringers do is, they, oh, you guys cannot see it right here. Spar, and these are the small ones are all stringers. I don't know whether you can see the stringers from the out back there. But you are putting some additional small small things that you do in larger aircraft. For most part in UAVs, you kind of don't use stickers, right? Because small UAVs, as it is with spar itself, it will be thinner, right? Because there are certain minimum thickness, you cannot go below that thickness, right? If it's composite also, even if it's aluminum, you are not going to go sit and you know chemically mill this uh, uh, sheet and make it really real. Or you are going to buy water is how much in the aluminum or water. So how, they, how uh, that's the other thing I should have asked you right uh, earlier, sir. How thin can this sheet, can this skin be? Right. Again, let me take a step back from UAV and talk about larger aircraft. One of the most uh, 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 I think uh, sold aircraft is Cessna 172, which is a four seater aircraft. Four people can sit, which means about 280 kgs per load. If it's 280 kgs per load, what should be your overall weight of your aircraft? this. If it's 280 kg, what do you think should be overall? Around one, one ton. Some one ton, around one ton, it's slightly less than that. Around one ton is going to be overall weight of the aircraft, right? So, see, if you look at it, between automobile and this, it's not very different. A car, which has to carry four people, is also about the same thing, right? Kind of similar, right? The reason why it's kind of similar, at least the way I think about it is, if you look at it in automobile, and engine flow is also it's kind of similar. In automobile also, you are here you have to overcome drag, and drag is typically 10% of your weight. In automobile, you have to overcome friction. And friction is again around that order, right? Friction between your wheel, rotor, I mean, your wheel is rotating, between your wheel and your road is again similar. Anyway, so there are a lot of similarities there. So let's come back to this. So you are looking at about one ton, right? It is carrying one ton overall, right? If it's carrying one ton overall, what do you think the thickness of the skin there is? The thickness of aluminum skin that they use uh, in, in the wing of the delta. Roughly, I mean, you should also have an idea what all these numbers are. What do you think is the thickness of skin? Upper skin. Lower skin, there are additional issues. Upper part of the skin. Please remember, as you apply load, it goes up like this. Upper part of the skin is under compression. Lower part is under tension. Upper part is the one which is more likely to fail under 
buckling, right? So you actually end up putting, that's the reason why I told it, it just, it matters whether it's up or down because swingers also you put more in the upper part because that's where chances of buckling are more. Anyway, let's step back. What do you think is the order of magnitude of all this? This is again something you should have in mind. Okay, what is practically feasible? What do you think is the thickness of this? Skin here from this Cessna 170, which is one turn aircraft. You are lifting one turn through these wings. Thickness of skin, any idea? 0.5 mm. That's all. That's all. Right? Closer to your leading edge, it's something close to 0.75 mm. Leading edge, you want much thicker. 1 mm, all close to 1 mm. Bottom is about 0.7 mm and so on. So these are all very, very small thickness. Right? You don't have to. Huh? Something, some separation occurs, it's okay. Leading edge you want to maintain, so that is slightly thicker because if there is a foreign object damage, it should not make a deeper dent, right? Typically, in almost all aircrafts, though buckling demands that upper surface should have larger thickness, a lot of times we have the lower surface which have larger thickness. Can you guess why? Upper surface rather than increasing thickness, I put stringers, that is more efficient. Lower surface, I will increase thickness, not just about, I mean, lower surface, in fact, is going to have only tension. Because it's going up, it's undergoing tension. But I rather like, in addition to putting singers, I will, I won't have too many singers there, but I will increase. Why do you think I increase? Yeah. Yeah. No. Pressure is very low compared to overall stresses it experiences in axial direction due to bending. Pressure is more distributed, very low. It kind of neglects the thing of models. That's the reason. This is like you take a B. You have done this uh, again. Those who are in mechanical, you guys have done uniformly distributed load, right? Even on a, a beam, and then uh, you kind of neglect the effect of the distributed load. You only determine failure based on axial stresses developed due to bending. It's like that. The distributed load doesn't really matter as much. Lower surface. It's all more mundane reasons. There is nothing. There is no nothing. I find physics about it. The mundane reason is. As your airplane is flying, you know, sorry, rolling from the runway, the wheels pick up stones and pebbles. And those things will hit, right? Larger the aircraft, you can pick up larger stones, right? Smaller aircraft will pick up smaller stones. Otherwise, like, I mean, the wheel will just go over it, right? It's much larger. So, all those pebbles will, it will pick up and because the wheel, wheel is rotating this, it will pick it up and hit your lower part of your wing. It can form dents. So that's the reason, one of the very, very mundane reasons why you want it to be thicker at the bottom, right? So these are all the things that you need to know and fix the structures typically, right? So anyway, thin thickness can be really small if you're using uh, aluminum and so on. Of course, uh, in, uh, in even in more commercial structures, you'll, uh, aluminum has certain advantages. I can also have, you know, the, it's like analog versus digital, right? In aluminum, I can literally go and have whatever thickness I want. Whereas if I want to use composites, they are discrete thicknesses because every layer will have some thickness. So I can only use uh, integral com integral uh, uh, com combinations of those thicknesses. Right? That's what I can do. Anyway, let's come back to alumina. So alumina, I end up having some skin. I end up having some spar, and I end up having some stringers in between. This eye section, as I said here, the borers are a part that I can move this. No, this, these two are the ones which are providing most of this Y square DA because from the central section it's as far as possible, right? Y square. If I can push it as far away from each other as possible, it's better form, right? And that is where we fight, right? Because typically this bar I put at the location in my airfoil where it has maximum thickness because that is where I'll get maximum moment of inertia to push the area far apart. And then I want to keep that maximum thickness of the airfoil itself as high as possible, right? So, whereas aerodynamics day wants it as low as possible, I want it as high as possible so that I can get a very large moment of inertia for same mass. That way I can make my structure a lot more efficient. So, we'll reach a, you know, kind of a compromise, right? If he makes it too thin, my structural weight will go very high. So, though he is maybe getting lesser drag coefficient, not drag, lesser drag coefficient, my overall weight of the system might go up so much that overall drag that he is uh, 
experiencing, which is, you know, drag will still depend on your weight, right? If weight goes up, your lift has to go up. If lift has to go up, drag has to go up. Because lift to drag ratio is what is kind of constant. So, though you may be making thinner, thereby achieving better, you know, reducing the drag coefficient, but overall, my weight is increasing too much because my spar weight will increase too much, right? That will be a problem. Similarly, if, if I go over to, let's say, 25% thickness, what happens is my weight will go down, but my drag will increase enormously. Again, it will not work. So, there are two competing things. We have to reach a compromise and see which combination works first. Right? For a larger uh, speed, larger aircraft, I may be able to get along with the smaller, I mean, order, uh, 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 lower thickness. But for some of these lower speed aircrafts, I mean, because please remember all the drag and all goes as V square, velocity square. For some of these uh, smaller aircrafts, I can think of much larger thickness. Right? Thickness could be, thickness to quarter ratio could be something as high as 18%. In some cases, they have used 22%, 24% also for very low speed flights because drag will not be that high, but I achieve very uh, uh, optimized structure weight wise, right? So those kind of things, that is something that you need to understand. Why we try to, why the structure guys will always try to tell aerodynamic case that I want larger thickness airfoil, right? And of course, if there's a larger thickness airfoil, there will be that airspace, you can do other things also in a larger airfoil. But anyway, so that is what we do. This is the kind of typical structures that we choose, right? And uh, all this skin is not in one single panel. There are multiple panels that we rivet together, right? If you look at any aircraft when you're flying, it's multiple panels which are riveted together. Why? Why? Machining. Machining. I mean, in this case, you take sheet metal, sheet metal bending. Right? So we are doing bending the sheet metal to conform to his contour. If I want to bend it too much, then it's too painful. So each of the panels I bend only a little bit, tool, and then you need to develop tooling for that. You bend it a little bit and then you put them together. That's one part of it. There is a secondary part of it, uh, which is related to something called this right chest. So what happens is, you know, if I take this sheet, right, I make a small tear. If I don't make the tear, then it will take a lot of load. If I make a small tear, you know, it will not take the same load, right? I don't want to break it right. So if I, if I pull it, it's going to break. Where did it break? Right along that. That's your track. You guys all know about tracks, right? So when there is track, then when I reach certain stage, it instantaneously fails. It just fails instantaneously when I reach that stage, right? So if I have a material which has developed track, at some particular load, it will fail instantaneously. When it fails, the entire sheet fails. So rather than this, can I, if I make this into strips, there are panels which are assembled together, small, small panels assembled together. When a crack forms in one of the panel, only that panel fails instantaneously. So let us say I had five panels here. Only one panel fails. Remaining four panels will redistribute that load. Right? And typically because of fatigue consideration, I would have kept my load only to be at about 60% of my yield strength. Right? It was 0.6 times yield strength. Now out of five panels, one panel I broke. Right? So now my each of the panels will not be taking 60% of yield strength. But it will be 60, 60 divided by 0 0.8. What will be 60 divided by 0 0.8? 600 by 8. Huh? 60 divided by 0.8. About 8. About 8. Okay. About 8. Yeah. It's about 8. About 8. So it will be taking 75% of my yield. Right? So it will fail faster if I eventually keep on doing this. But the moment one panel has failed, when it lands, I can figure out and then I can replace the panel. It will not be catastrophic. The entire thing will not disintegrate in one shot. Same thing here. It actually has an advantage in making them in panels. Only that panel may fail. I can replace that panel. I can repair that panel. A lot more easily. Not just that, safety wise, it's better. Only that the damage is constrained to that particular panel. Of course, it doesn't always work, right? So the assumption is okay, once panel, one panel breaks off, then we can replace. There are certain cases where, you know, in one particular classic case, again, we can look it up something called Aloha Airlines incident in 1980s. Aloha and Fairlines incident, what happened is there were small, small cracks in each of these panels. Each of these cracks were small enough that they said this individual crack won't grow into failure immediately, so let's play with this. But then all those cracks linked up. They all linked up. And suddenly, midair, one part of the fuselage just flew off. 
broke and flew off, right? Uh, and uh, immediately, of course, cabin depressurization occurs, and then immediately the, uh, the guy brought the pilot was good enough. He brought it down to such a lower altitude, and then uh, uh, kind of you know uh, it, it went okay except for one loss of life, right? The uh, only person who died is a uh, aeronautist because he was walking around, right? Everybody else was buffeted up. He was walking around. And then as it has as deep pressurization as that, because please remember the fuselage is always pressurized. And the outside pressure is very low. Body cannot pressurize. Fuselage is always pressurized. So when it blew off, it, you know, she got sucked out of the So she died. So that's how they were buffeted in. So they all, that's the reason why they can keep on and sitting buckle up, buckle up, and so on. Right? Any such small mishap happens, and it just will not like except that one leg, nothing else happened, right? So anyway, that is the other thing. Right? You know, uh, this, these things can also link up, but for the most part, it's advantageous to have it in panels, removing, replacing, everything is easy. I can replace one panel easily. I cannot replace the entire thing easily. Right? So that is in a larger aircraft. In a UAV, a smaller UAV, smaller fixed UAV, I may not have to do this. I can use one single sheet to make the entire thing, right? Because first of all, it's a small one, uh, it may be 30 centimeter, uh, reach the part, the entire thing is going to be 60 centimeters. 60 centimeters, I can't handle it. It will become more painful to do that. Then I have to rewrite, I have to do this, I have to do that. I might just use one single sheet and get out of it. If I have to replace, it may be, if it's a small UAV, I may be able to even just jump that thing and then even replace it. Right? So there we may not worry about it, but in a larger aircraft, it's advantageous to have it in panels, just in some panels, right? In a smaller UAV, it doesn't fail. So these are all the kind of considerations that uh, what's it? Kind of, okay. So these are all the kind of considerations that we do in making UAVs, right? And even in fixed wing UAV, for the most part, in a whole lot of very very small UAVs, you can get away with just skin because skin already has certain minimum thickness. Even if I'm using aluminum, standard thicknesses that may be available, maybe 0.5 mm. You are not going to try and put a 0.25 mm. You are not going to try and maintain it to a 0.25 mm. Way more expensive. You may just want to use the same 0.5 mm directly. Though we are structural weight wise, it may be slightly higher. But if I try to make it optimize structure, my cost will go up. There is always that also, right? And then I mean, it's all my, all the uh, uh, systems that we develop, right? We keep in mind that we want to optimize weight and so on, but we don't always achieve that optimized weight because of economic consideration, right? If I try and achieve, if I'm totally, you know, after it and I try and achieve that optimum structure, it will become very expensive. Again, we'll have to sit together and say, how expensive am I ready to lower? So there is some give and take, right? What is that give and take? Finally, everything is economic consideration, everything is economic decision. What happens is, if I don't optimize the structure, my operational cost will go high because I have to spend more fuel. Compared to that cost, this upfront cost increase will is it acceptable? So you'll have upfront cost if I optimize it because my cost of manufacturing increases, but that, that may be able to compensate for savings in operational cost. So you have to do that calculation and see which is the most optimized structure. So from a structural weight optimization as well as economic operations, I mean economic uh, economics of operations. Anyway, so that's one thing. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, any of these things you would want to use standard components as much as possible, but then go back and do this kind of verification. So when you use the standard configurations in UAVs, you may be able to get away with only skin. But if it's larger UAV, you may want sparse. Very large UAV, most of you will not be working on it immediately, but if you go to a company and which is making a two ton or a two ton, three ton kind of UAVs for arm focused applications, there for those kind of applications, you may also want to put in some spring weapons, that's spring weapons, right? So that's what you'll end up doing in all these groups, right? So that's, uh, this is regarding structure. Of course, now I'll just take five, 10 minutes on uh, flavor of the uh, season, which is everybody wants to for this. Right? Again, composites definitely have a place, but the also the composites will replace everything is again foolishness. Just like I said about EV, battery can will be EVs will be there in a lot of places, but to think that they will replace everything is foolishness. We have different varieties for different applications. Same way composites may be okay for airframe. You know, practically are not going to use composites in your engine. Even in airframe, there are components that you are not going to be using for composites. For composites are notorious, they have their own issues, right? We don't understand 
very well how they fail or rather we understand but there is so many uncertainty in a metal if i do 100 tests right from a given chunk of metal the yield stress will be within one or two percent right right or maybe three percent right I'm, I'm making sense if somebody says aluminum i said aluminum has 20 uh, aluminum 2024 20, has 270 megapascals as yield stress it will be within plus or minus five Mega Whereas in a composite, that variation is very large. I can't live with that variation, right? Because that variation has an effect. So if I look at uh, when I design everything, we have talk, talk about probabilities, right? Probability of failure, right? When I have more confidence in my value, my yield stress, then I can say that the probability is very high 99.99%, it is not going to fail at this goal, right? Then people will come and fly here. If you say probability, I'm you know I'm uh, doing uh, I'm calculating the mean uh, uh, failure strength of a composite, right? But then I have a large spread. If the spread is large, my probability of failure also increases, right? If you say I have 95 percent confidence that it will not fail, right? Right? When you're sitting in this airplane, do you think anybody will sit in the airplane? Nobody will sit in the airplane. It's like oh, five percent chance is there that I might die. Is that not that's right? So composites have this problem. So you have to not be, so though on, in, in, in principle, you say the strengths are very high, that strength means that is very high. So when you want to go to higher probability levels, you have to go to less than. So if you look at your distribution, probability levels will increase if you go to lower and lower stresses. So you will be designing at lower stress to compensate for variation in its properties. Right? That's one aspect. Of course, most of us, when we talk about composite, we talk about carbon fiber or some other reinforced plastics. So if you look at this reinforced plastics, right? If you look at any of this reinforced plastics, uh, they're all, you know, the, the basic matrix material is all plastic. That's why it's called reinforced. Most of these materials cannot withstand very high temperature, right? How, how, how high temperature? Do you think some of these plastics can handle? 150 degrees, right? But then, What's my problem? Do you think my airplane ever, airframe ever sees 150 degrees? Other stuff will be new over. Right? 50 degrees is all you see. So, what is the problem? If you go up, high up, temperature drops, it doesn't increase. What will be better? No, no, no. Friction is no drag. Friction? There are paints I can use. Huh? Air drag. Air drag. Friction. I can apply paint. I can apply some coating <laughs> to take care of friction. Hmm? It's a lower temperature which is the problem. All these plastics, all the all this, all this glass transition temperature, all things they become very brittle at very low temperature. So low temperature it becomes extremely brittle. Plastic pipes also you'll see, not just due to temperature friction at low temperatures they become brittle. That is a big problem. There is another problem where why we don't go for too many composite components, I mean, there are various problems. One other problem which you may not think of in a larger aircraft which they use for transportation is, you know, lightning strikes, right? Lightning strikes, why do lightning strikes occur? Charges accumulate, right? If it's an insulator on top of a tree or on top of a building, charges accumulate and then, you know, charges are there on your cloud and there is a, you know, there is a, uh, you know then there is a electric arc which forms between the two opposite charges. Same thing can happen in an airplane. Instead of that, how do you how do you take care of a, a lightning in you know, a tall building? Lightning arresters. What are these lightning arresters? Metal rods. Metal rods. Metal rods with spikes. Spikes because if it's upper corner, that's where charges tend to accumulate. And so you put this metal pipe, but the charges will never accumulate because they'll get conducted away. Right? Only if it accumulates, it's a problem. That's why the charge accumulation occurs only in insulators, not in conductors. So if you're using aluminum airframe, charges get conducted. Will it really get spread out so it does not get concentrated? Whereas if you are using composite, they can accumulate with chips and it can allow lightning strikes. So that's yet another issue. There are a whole lot of issues with respect to composites. Again, composite repair is a problem. Aluminum repair is easy. Cost of composite material itself is very high compared to aluminum. Right? Aluminum, it's all measured in kgs. Per kg, it is like 200 rupees or something. Composite materials try by. Let us see. Right? So these are all the issues why composite materials, while they definitely have applications, may not be, may not replace all the components like somebody keeps saying, right? Some, like people keep saying. 
again, right from my undergrad days, people have been saying composites will just take over the world. You know, the strength that you will achieve is very high, especially, you know, right from my B.Tech days, they have figured out these carbon nanotubes. In composite, I put in carbon nanotubes, and then uh, that will give really, really high strength, because carbon nanotubes have high strength when I was in B.Tech. That was, uh, so yeah, my, this is my silver reunion. It's 25 years. 25 years back. So 25 years reunion is going to happen in this December. So they said that at that time they said once we figure out, once we figure out how to put all these carbon nanotubes together, they are so strong that we'll pick elevator to space. I'm still waiting for elevator to space. In fact, mostly the elevators that we have in our building themselves are not working well. I don't know when we'll build elevator to space, right? Weight wise, right? Or the building elevators themselves are very heavy. When will we go to space? I don't know, right? Through elevators. Right? It is not going to happen because the moment you assemble all these carbon nanotubes together, junctions will be where it will fail. Each nanotube may be very strong, but the junction is where you will fail. Same thing happens in your composite material also. Your individual fibers may be very strong, but the moment you put in resin in that, the interface between resin and fiber may be weaker. And that way, that's where it's going to fail. Because they have to adhere properly, right? One part. Second part is you want to use as many fibers as possible, as few, as, as less matrix as possible. I mean, it's a, it's a fiber alone, which is which has better strength to it, not your matrix. Matrix is there only to bind the fibers together, right? So that's what that's what it is achieving, right? So if you're looking at this, if you want to have higher and higher um, uh, what we call as fiber volume fraction, typically you, you know what is the volume fiber volume fraction. Fiber volume fraction is if I take volume, or what fraction of that volume is fiber as compared to overall volume. Rest of it is matrix. Right? Matrix is this fluid which will go and solidify in the fiber. Fiber fraction is typically of the order of 60 to 70 percent. Theoretical thing you can calculate. You know, the J problem. No? So you have the square, you have, you have four cylinders, right? What is the gap between the four cylinders? Okay. If you look at the four cylinders, you connect all the centers, overall area of the cylinder is going to be pi r square. The four quarters of the cylinder, and the square will have an area. That area is going to be two times r square, that is four r square, four r square by five pi r square. So maximum ratio, theoretical ratio possible is five by four. Right? That is the maximum ratio that is possible, close to seventy-five percent. But then that assumes that there is almost zero thickness between the two fibers. If it's zero thickness, how am I going to have bond bonding? So I have to have some thickness of matrix in between and so on. So typically, it is going to be sixty to seventy percent is what is achievable. Right? But then in this 60 to 70 percent, if I if my as my whole if the gap between my fibers becomes smaller and smaller, so only then I can achieve the 60 to 70 percent. How will you ensure that as you push this matrix, if the beginning matrix is in fluid form, how do you push it between the gap? Right? Viscosity is high. If viscosity is high, it will not want to occupy gaps in between very easily. So resin infusion is what they call that will not happen so easily, right? If you try to make a higher and higher volume fraction. And into that resin, if you go and now add your carbon nanotube, it will not go anywhere. So I'll have huge holes in between and it will fail at those holes. These are all the problems that composites also have, right? So we have to think about how well you do it. Of course, when you are buying composite rods for your pond rotors or water, if you're doing it for your hobby purposes, all of them will say, Oh, this is CFRP, and you will go back and look at a website. In some website, they'll say, oh, CFRP has 1,000 pandemic megapascals. That is some CFRP made in a laboratory condition. This CFRP will not have the same strength. So when you buy any of these materials, before you use for your application, just go back. You would have done some calculations saying this will be adequate. Go back, take one piece, test it out, and see whether it is really has high that strength or not. I will assure you, none of the CFRPs that you buy are going to have strength more than some 300, 400 megapascals. At this point of time, you have to sit back and say, wait a minute, the aluminum also has similar strength. Right? Aluminum also has similar strength one part. Aluminum density is also similar. Not too much. So weight saving I'm achieving is not much. Aluminum is easy to drill, easy to assemble everything. Is it really worth going for the composition? You have to think about those kind of things. Right? It may sound fancy. You can impress people. Saying I use composites, but does it really work? Right? It's, if I use aluminum, it will be cheaper, easy to assemble. We all know how to handle metals. Really, if you composite to grill, you will get delamination. Right? There are various other problems with CFRP, by the way. If you grill this, CFRP, I mean, these are serious issues they tackle, try to tackle. 
So if you take the CFRP, drill a hole, right? The carbon fibers are exposed. You put a try to put a metal uh, fastener, the metal and there is something called galvanic corrosion, right? Electrical engineers is also know galvanic corrosion because you do deal, you actually deal with corrosion all over the place in your connector, right? So galvanic corrosion occurs because it's ionic, it's ionic, right? Ionic reactions, right? So the, the metal uh, 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 fastener and the carbon fiber touching each other, I mean, will lead to galvanic corrosion of this fastener, right? And that can lead to failures. So there are a whole lot of issues which come up when you handle this composite material. Metals, all of them are much more detailed. So sometimes sit back and think, are you doing this only because it's fashionable or does it actually make sense? Right? As engineers, you should try and make things which make sense, not because they're fashionable. Right? In liberal arts, you do fashionable things. Engineering, you're not so fashionable. You're always thinking of what is most functional. Right? I need to think only of functionality. Functionality is, how do I make sure that it serves my purpose at minimum cost? That's it. It serves my purpose at minimum cost. That's always my cost. When you talk about cost, it's not material procurement. It's also about material procurement, manufacturing cost, and life cycle management cost. There are certain things composites there also they take ahead. In an aluminum metal, if not for you, but let's say if I'm trying to use this UAV for 10 years, if there is a, you know, if I want to do inspection, Right? You have to do inspection every now and then to make sure there are no cracks and there are no damages. When you want to do inspection, non-destructive annihilation, aluminum, it's, there are a lot more options. You can do ultrasound technique, you can use eddy current, you can use magnetic, all kinds of things. Right? All of them are easier in metals, whereas if you look at composite materials, you can't use ultrasound as easily because ultrasound waves will dampen out very fast in a composite material as compared to a metal. Right? In a metal, you all, all have a composite metal. Now, dampening is much less. So, that's why in a railway track, you know, if you put your ears, don't do it. Even if the train has gone very, very far, you can still hear because in metal, it can, it won't get dampened out as much. Whereas in a plastic, it will get, things will get dampened out. Right? So, uh, so these are all the issues. So, ultrasound, you cannot use to detect tracks. And also, in metals, typically tracks occur on free surfaces. What is the advantage of free surface? I can see the free surface. This is a free surface. Free surface means exposed surface. Whereas in composites, some of the damage occurs between the layers. Very difficult to detect. So there is, I need to use more expensive, this, you know, uh, uh, tools to detect this damage. So again, my cost becomes higher. So it's not trivial, it's not always obvious that we should use composite materials, right? Because manufacturing, you know, material cost is more, manufacturing cost is more because when you're making this composite means you make a mold first, and on top of that mode, you lay this, let it cure. Sometimes you have to put it in autoclave, all kinds of nonsense you have to do, right? So it becomes pro procure material procurement is expensive, fabrication is expensive, inspection is also expensive. Even all these things, would it make sense to use composite? Right? Sometimes it does. I'm not saying it never does. Sometimes it does. That's why I work on composites. Sometimes it doesn't, right? Then you have to use your aluminum. So don't get wedded to certain ideology saying composite, 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 or metal, metal, metal. Whatever is required for that particular purpose, whatever works best, works best. So all I'm saying is any application, in any, I mean, whatever I'm saying for materials here, equally holds good for any other system on in any other field that you're talking about. Don't do it because, you know, everybody says this is fashionable. Sit, think, and see what makes best sense. Be agnostic when it comes to all these systems, right? You are an engineer. It is your job to be agnostic, right? You should not get ready to use only these kind of systems. Analog circuits are digital, right? Right? I don't know the full details, but again, there also, I'm sure there are some debates. And again, which one should you use? Well, it depends on your application. If you get wedded to one, it does not work out, right? Because that may not, then you might end up using suboptimal solution. So don't get wedded to one particular technology. Whatever it works, whatever works, works, right? And then you have to compare it with other available technology. Be convinced that as to among the two, which is the best, right? Be convinced, right? Be convinced, you know, from a practical sense, right? I mean, not just, you know, on a, in an ideological sense. Right? So that I learned, I think, uh, already one ten, huh? Yeah, one ten. That I learned. I have taken my own papa. So any questions? 
So overall, what I want you to take back from this is when you're choosing material, again, please remember strength to weight ratio is one thing, but that's not the only thing. It has to be cheaper, cheaper to procure, cheaper to machine, cheaper to maintain, right? So that's why materials you would choose appropriately. Similarly, all the structures, mostly you want to use thin wall sections, open, uh, close, sorry, closed sections, closed wall, closed wall, closed, uh, sorry, closed thin wall sections, right? And, um, you you are always better off rather than using very thick uh, 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 sheets. You are always better off using thin sheets like your thing. Thin sheets are simple. These are all the overall things that we do in structures, right? And then that's why you see certain structures when you go and look at a UAV. You see these kind of structures with spar and with skin and whatnot, right? So and other things. There are other few other things which you you know. This is not exactly structures, but you know. In a, typically, if you take an airplane wing, UAV wing. If you can make it in the wing in three parts, right? You know, central part of the wing can be uh, merged with your fuselage. Other two parts, the out outside parts can be separate parts which are connected to the central part. The advantages that you will gain. If one advantage is you can all uh, disassemble them, carry them in a smaller package, right? Other advantage that you gain is if you are going and usually typically extremities are the places where you get damage. Extremities are the ones which are likely to hit something. If it gets damaged, you just replace that one. So make it making it modular has an advantage of being easy, making it easy to carry at the same time easy to replace components, right? Modular. But if you make it too many components, then it's a then you have to maintain all this inventory. Make sure one component is not missing. That's a different matter. Again, you do optimization there. So you make it modular, but at the same time, make don't make it too many components, right? Modularity has its issues. Has its uh, issues at the same time as its advantages, right? So if you make this wing, typically that's how most a lot of us make. So there is central fuselage. To that, your central portion of your wing is firmly attached, and then to uh, 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 you already talked about root and tip. Or, uh, sorry, so tip of the tips of your wings are going to be made up. You know, uh, are going to be separate components. You assemble them together. Right. That's what you'll. That what would work out ideally. Right. And extremities are always a problem. Even in your body, typically your injuries are all here and in your legs. Right, those are the extremities which are in contact. Right, unless you are accident prone like me, I can hit myself anywhere. Right, that <laughs> happens. I mean, I'll suddenly go hit myself here because I'll hit like this and so on. Right, unless you are accident prone like that, you are always going to be hitting at extremities. Right, so that's the reason. Huh? You can tell the wing root wing tip. Actually, I didn't tell them. Ah, the wing root. I mean, this is my wing. This is roots. That is tip. That's it. so. Uh, of course, uh, the human in body. Uh, these things have a natural uh, things. If you look at a lot of uh, uh, people who are diabetic, right? Usually the injuries that occur are all in their fingers and their toes, and that's where sometimes uh, they yeah, don't heal very well. They end up getting gangrene and so on. And usually it's in legs and hands, and that's because of this reason. They always anywhere, whether it's your aircraft, your body, whatever it is, it's always you have to be careful about your extremities. That's where you're likely to get hit, right? And get to have damage, right? So these are all things I mean, I'm sure even in your applications, you'll find something like that. Extremities are available. And then it's better, I mean, body, you can't uh, have detachable fingers, but luckily, <laughs> you can have detachable uh, uh, tip, wing tips. Right? And sometimes you also put oh, one other thing you might have talked to you about is uh, uh, the wing tip, you will have sometimes winglets, something called winglets. There will be some small curvature so that you don't have Flow uh, bending, I mean, uh, curving over that, so to reduce your drag. And then you do some of those caps also. Those caps can also be uh, material, certain materials which, when as in the process of breaking, they might uh, absorb a lot of energy. And right again, that's an advantage. There is a concept of mechanical fuse. I'll just take five minutes. It's okay. If there's a concept of mechanical fuse, electrical guys, or everybody, forget about electrical computer science, doesn't matter. We use fuses everywhere, right? In your in our homes, there's this concept of fuse. What is the concept of fuse? Why do you want to break the circuit? Because there is a high voltage there. And that appliance is expensive. So you sacrifice this one small piece of wire, which is very cheap, so that you can save our appliance. Same thing we do in mechanics as well, right? When you're assembling nut and bolt together, you use washers. Why do you use washers? See it properly. I mean, rubber, not one, not like rubber washers, even metal washers. Right, metal yeah. washers play support, no? Yeah, uh, yeah. I can't give certain examples which we used to do long ago. Uh, no, look, we were all much poorer. 
So when we used to do in Deepavali, we used to put this board with some washers and then in between washers, you keep this uh, small uh, cracker and then you drop it and then close my water. Anyway, so you know, right, when you assemble nuts and bolt, you put a washer. Why do you put that washer? Here. Huh? Here. To? Create air gap. To create air gap, no. I mean, in certain applications, yes, but I'm talking about simple assembly. I take two plates, I put nut and bolt, I tighten. But if I don't, should not put nut and bolt and tighten them together, I will always put some small washer for two reasons. One is the nut will have sharp corners and that will dig into my main body, right? So that main body, if it digs into that entire body, I'll have to replace after a few assembly and disassembly. Whereas this washer, it will dig into washer. Washer in turn will also, that second part of it is washer will also redistribute load over a larger area. Your nut and bolt is over a smaller area. It will redistribute, that's the second part. But one main thing is it should not dig into my structure. Because after a few assembly and disassembly, the, my actual st structure will get worn off or will have a, uh, scratches. And then that can lead to failure or it can lead to loose assemblies. So washer thing is each washer will cost you 10 paise or like I don't know, not, maybe not even be that. One rupee will get so many washers maybe. So each of these washers are cheap. So in fact, one of the things we should remember is when you assemble and disassemble, if it's a critical component, never reuse washer. That's the entire concept. Washer, once you tighten it, it has dug in, it has got damage. Next time you remove it, you throw away the washer, put a new washer, anyway it's dirt cheap. So you end up sacrificing the washer. It's some sense of metal, mechanical fuels. You're sacrificing a cheaper component to protect your a more expensive component. There are a whole lot of places we use this, right? Uh, another classic case of mechanical fuels is, you know, again, to give my own personal uh, uh, experience, I went with my friend, We, you know, first time we flew together to Purdue University, and then this guy, he was he's a very good violinist, so he brought uh, 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 his violin in a violin case, Right on in the tra in transition when we actually reached Purdue, the violin case had broken. Right, violin was okay, violin case was broken, and my friend was a bit upset, saying that hey, dude, this is a flimsy, uh, you know, not a good quality violin case. It broke, but then I had learned my <laughs> uh, practical mechanics and other things properly. This was the good uh, uh, guitar case, a violin case. In this case, violin case. All these cases are made such that they will break before your guitar or violin case. Why? Because in the process of breaking, you know, I have all the stress strain curve, very stress strain curve, area under the stress strain curve is energy stored in it. But what happens when it breaks? Just like the oh, entire energy gets converted to heat, right? So it dissipates that energy. So the process of breaking takes mechanical energy and it pushes it out as heat energy, right? With thermal energy, right? So the same thing will happen here. When it when you drop it, if it does not break, it will transfer all that energy to your violin, and your violin will break. So you design it such that it breaks before your violin. In the process of breaking, it will dissipate all that energy. Force cannot be dissipated. Energy can be dissipated, and the energy that your violin sees is going to be much lesser. So it will stay intact, right? So that we use even in aircrafts, helicopter skids. Helicopter skids are designed in such a way that in some rough landing, they will yield. They will yield heavy, right? The reason, and the process of yielding, they will dissipate the energy. So it provides some sort of cushioning effect. So you sacrifice it. Then you remove it and put a new one skid. But then you design it such that it yields because the person sitting inside then will not see all that impact energy being transferred. Right? Similarly, your, uh, even in your UAVs, you have to design it such that if you're a component is very critical, sensor is very critical. You design it such that if there's a rough landing, your landing gear will have a controlled failure. Am I making sense? You want to have a controlled failure, sacrifice it. So these are all mechanical fuses. So there are a whole lot of mechanical fuses that we use in aircrafts. Right? So that's where I'm saying even tips. Make sure that you know it is it can be in some material which will dissipate a lot of energy. And you can remove that and put something else. And in fact, if you look at your wing. For example, majority of the uh, uh, bending moment is at this, right, at root, not at tip. In fact, in at tip, you don't even have to put metal or uh, composite. Put one flimsy plastic one. It will dissipate energy, it will break and crumble and dissipate energy if it fits somewhere. It will be very cheap. If you can make a plastic mode, you can, you know, these plastic components are very cheap. So if this breaks, you remove that, put a new one. Right? Those are a whole lot of things because there you don't need very high strength because the stresses are much lower. 
So be a bit more innovative, take out you know, what all you want to do. So if you have a rough idea of what materials are all about, where stresses are maximum, you have to remember root stress maximum, tip stress are minimum. You can toy around this. You don't have to be a structural engineer to look at it in full detail, but you at least should have an idea where I can use different kind of materials and you can sacrifice certain components and so on. Right? So mechanical fuse is a very important concept which we use very heavily. Right? Guitar case, as I said, helicopter skits, cell AK, all kinds of places. Right? And that's all. I went on a rant on some other things. So, any other questions? I'm happy I didn't get a call. So, <laughs> in case there are no questions, I would like to thank Murthy sir for a very interesting talk. Yeah, man. And uh, right now, the you must have noticed the uh, car. <laughs> 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 <laughs